Revolution definitely means change and uh, standing up for what you believe in. Revolution is to be uh, happy about whatever you do and not feel guilty for it. Revolution. <laughs> Act up, fighting out, <laughs> speaking your beliefs. <laughs> A lot of people that I slept with. <laughs> yeah, let's check that out. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so it's going to be your job to guess who that is. Transformation, shift in consciousness, a new way of being. A giant, violent change. Daring to be different. Kicking ass and taking names. Have there been any surprises on this tour? Um, I didn't realize that Bruce Daniels was going to be such a monster. I mean, I knew that he had an ego problem, but I really didn't think that he was really going to try to try to um, ruin me. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mr. Bruce Daniels. What's going on? Oh, oh uh -oh, yeah, uh -oh. Uh -oh. about you. So now's your turn. <laughs> what, what, what were you talking about? Nothing. I'm over here. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> A customer said to me, you know what? I think that you're the first black bartender in West Hollywood. <laughs> Fuck Halle Berry, the doors have been opened. Yes, the tour is, what, half over? I actually have a great time with her. Yeah, we have fun. We laugh a lot, which is good. Yeah. We're like the Judds. We're just like the Judds. Or have, like, straight white guys come up to me like, dude, dude, <laughs> dude. You're fucking whiter than I am. Okay, first of all, you're over 30. You don't get to say dude anymore. And secondly, just because I speak proper English doesn't make me whiter than you, just smarter than you. But I'm Naomi. No, you're not. <laughs> I'm Naomi. Then no. I'll call me Ashley. <laughs> no, you can't be... <laughs> You already said you took Naomi, so I'm gonna be Ashley. Don't try to get me to be Winona. Mom, I'm gay. And then she leans over and then she kisses me and she says, Thank you for telling me. And then we continue shopping at Neiman Marcus. <laughs> no, it's not really like that. We're not really mad at each other. It's a game. It is always a game. It's it a, is. It is a game. It's a dangerous game. It, <laughs> but I find it to be a crying game. <laughs> right now, I'd like to bring up the person who I believe should be president of everything. She's the most intelligent, talented, beautiful person I know, Margaret Cho. Chris Daniels, everyone. Chris Daniels. Oh no! Thank you. Oh my goodness. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, please. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Um, oh, gosh. Oh, now you made me feel all bashful. I'm so shy. Oh, thank you. That's wonderful. Well, thank you for coming. This is very exciting because we're making a movie, as you can see the cameras. Yes. Yes, we are. Thank you for being a part of it. This is exciting because, um, you know, when we, we down in Koreatown making a movie, okay? That's, just, that's, some, that's some shit right there, all right? I'm so excited about that, okay? I'm really happy. I think, like, it's just a, a very a bizarre time in history. It's such a weird time in the world. Um, and I would feel a little bit better if uh, George W. Bush could say the word nuclear correctly because... <laughs> He says it like, nuclear. <laughs> That's not how you say it. <laughs> you would have thought somebody would have said something by now. I mean, at the very least, Condoleezza Rice would have got up in his face. Four is nuclear! <laughs> I'm 
gonna have to write it down for you. <laughs> I'm making flashcards for the president. This is. Mm -mm. I told that joke on TV and I got a really angry letter. Dear Miss Cho, I can't believe that you would speak of our beloved president in this manner. <laughs> you know, intelligence is not the reason that somebody gets elected to the presidency. <laughs> oh, I totally forgot about thievery and nepotism. <laughs> I mean, it just blew my mind. Um, And then she had gone all around her office and had everybody sign a petition. I'm like, I hate you, Margaret. I hate you. I hate you. I hate you. So um, I wrote her back and I said, fuck you. And I had all my friends sign. I mean, people are acting like so weirdly paranoid about talking and saying anything negative about the war with the government. I mean, everybody got upset at the Dixie Chicks because they said they were ashamed to be from Texas. And yeah, I mean, the, I understand what they mean. I mean, they just, they can say what they want too. And, and the press blew it all out of proportion. Like there was like a big, you know, big, Dixie Chicks CD destroying festivals, and it was the same picture every time. It was one redneck stepping on his jewel case. <laughs> that he had accidentally dropped on the way out of Sam Goody. So he actually had to go back and get another one. And the artists are supposed to comment on culture. That's uh, the function of art. So. I don't understand why they have to have such a backlash. It's, it's, it's just crazy. And this whole war just seems to me like a big penis contest between, you know, George and Saddam. You know, like, whose is bigger, whose is oilier. <laughs> Who's got the foreskin? And I, I, I can't, I cannot, honestly, I have to abdicate my crown. I cannot wear this crown anymore <laughs> in good conscience after I said the word foreskin. And also, <laughs> this is, that's, I gotta take that off too. I don't like it. And that's not my hair. You know, no, see. You know I would never get this chinky of a haircut. Please, oh please. So, we're in Koreatown, so I have to take off my boots. Bruce, Bruce help me, Bruce could you please? Bruce Daniels, everybody. Bruce, could you help me please? I can't do these by myself, they're Kapali. I can't, how do it? You gonna pull my leg off? She is trying. You trying to pull my leg off? I don't know what you're you talking are, about. You are purposely I am trying. Not trying to, not you you are trying to pull. Yeah, you trying to pull my leg off? Ow! Oh, shit. shit! This is Bruce Eve Harrington Daniels. That's him, <laughs> right there. Wait, wait, wait. Here, take. Here. Oh, I have to. Oh. No. Cry, cry, go cry. Crying, crying, crying. Chris Daniels, everybody. Thank you. <laughs> so um, even though everything else is insane, uh, actually my life is for once very good. I just got out of a very long-term relationship and monogamy is so weird. Like when you know their name and stuff. 
you know, we live together, and when you live together, sex takes on a whole new dimension. I feel like a prostitute that works for really low rates. <laughs> I'll do oral and anal. if you take out the garbage. <laughs> I'll lick your balls. <laughs> if you open this jar. Do I have to eat your ass? <laughs> to get you to mow the lawn! There was just never that um, chemical attraction between us. It just didn't work that way. And um, talk about pity sex. Uh, I mean, <laughs> this was some UNICEF fucking going on, okay? I <laughs> oh yeah, the March of Dimes was calling me up saying, could you please give this man some hands, please? That's sad. When you're in the bed and you're just like. Maybe you should reconsider the relationship, if that's you. <laughs> but we had been together for so long that um, we never fought over anything, so there was never any point of entry into the breakup. It was just hard to get into. Like, how do you, you know, it's like trying to jump into an already started game of double dutch. Like, <laughs> I fucking hate your guts! You know, like, what do you... trying to save the relationship by talking about having a baby, you know, like, that's gonna work. I, I, I had a great, great experience recently. I helped deliver one of my best friend's children, and uh, wow, when you witness something like that, you see how powerful women are, that we bring forth life. I mean, it's awesome, and I just, I, I just was so amazed by my friend because she was not just a woman. She was not just a mother. At that moment, she was creation. She was life. She was God. And as I looked in her eyes, <laughs> her pussy exploded. A piece of it hit me in here. 
everybody else was like holding each other and crying. And I'm like, her fucking pussy is flat! The nurse was running around collecting pieces of her pussy in a basket. <laughs> She's just panning for pussy. had to sew it back together. <laughs> Franken pussy. Reader. <laughs> I have no maternal instincts whatsoever. I am barren. I am bone dry. When I see children, I feel nothing. I ovulate sand. <laughs> but my friend's such a good mom, and she calls me up all the time. Hello? Is it Margaret? A person who needs us to meet you right now. It's very urgent that she speak to you right away. I said, bitch, do not put your baby on the phone. <laughs> she always tries to get me to hold it. Like, I don't want to hold. You can hold it. I don't want to hold it. And the baby's like, ah! <laughs> so I just ate her. <laughs> I suppose if I get the urge later on, I could just adopt one of those kids from Cambodia like Angelina Jolie. Because really, who's going to know? <laughs> uh, I was in Southeast Asia. I was in Bangkok and uh, I, 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 uh, I was, I was, there's such a weird city. They, they have sex shows happening all the time. And there are people standing outside the show trying to get you to come in by telling you what the show is about. Pussy eat banana! I'm not in the mood for dinner theater. Thanks. <laughs> Pussy play ping pong! 
well, I want to go. <laughs> Does it really play like <laughs> the table and stuff? <laughs> How does it hold the paddle? Pussy right letter! <laughs> what kind of letter is pussy going to write? <laughs> Four score and seven years ago. I'm trying to give them suggestions on what might make a better show. How about, um, um, pussy come free with purchase of Pussy of equal or greater value! <laughs> Big hit. And um, I like going to Asia because they're all kind of Asian people there. Because <laughs> I grew up, you know, you know in um, this immigrant family, and it's hard when you're a child of immigrants. Um, you know, you spend half your day in America and the rest of your day in a foreign land. <laughs> and um, I didn't have things that other kids had. You know, like I, I mean, I didn't have like um, uh, scotch tape or uh, <laughs> or any um, kind of adhesive, and uh, <laughs> I would ask my mom for it. I would ask my mom for it, and, uh, and she would say, uh, why don't you just use the rice? You just take a little bit, and then make very sticky. Then you don't have to have a groove or tape. You don't have, no, you just use a little bit of a, uh, uh, Rise! And then this bed is sticky, and then you don't have to have a little bit of You just use a little bit of a Rise! Being in a uh, sort of a family of immigrants can be frustrating and embarrassing. You get fucked up shit in your lunchbox. All the other kids would get granola bars and Capri Sun. I would get dried fish. <laughs> All the other kids got ho-hos and ding-dongs. I got squid and peanuts. You can't trade that. <laughs> Yet I was a, a very ambitious kid. I, I really wanted to be a stand-up comic, and I also um, wanted to be an actress. And I see, I am a secretly a costume drama queen. Ooh, I love me some Marcia Ivory films. I do. If there is a petticoat and Helena Bonham Carter already, I can feel the tears well up in my eyes. I love me some period films. And I know that I will never be in them. No, uh, no, I will, no, I will never, no, I will never, no, I will never be in any, no, I will never be in, I will, no, no, I will never be in any of these films. No, no, I, no, no, see, I will, no, I will never be in any, no, I, no, see, okay, I, 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 I will never be in any of these movies. No, not unless I am laying down on my side no, okay, so opium. <laughs> and I get offered movie roles all the time. And I say, no, no, I don't want to play a manicurist. <laughs> I don't want to play a really pissed off liquor store owner. <laughs> no, 
know I do not want to go anywhere with a chicken under my arm. <laughs> I don't want to play an exceptionally good student. I do not want to get off a tour bus and take numerous photographs. <laughs> I do not ever want to utter the phrase, Welcome to Japan, Mr. Bun. <laughs> no, I don't want to write my memoirs about being a geisha, because that's boring. What's that going to be like? Well, today I got up out my bed. Then I put my makeup on. It would make me look all white. Then. <laughs> Oh, girl, you gotta wear this big ass wig that it just hurt your back, hurt your legs. It's a, that heavy, that wig. You put it on your head and you put it on your side of your head, both sides upside your head. You have this wig on. When it on, you just look like a shamrock. It's big. <laughs> then you have to put on about five dresses, and on top of that, you put on a big ass belt. They called it an OB, because it's like OB look like a backpack. That's so big. <laughs> Then I spend the rest of the day being a hoe. <laughs> I do not wish to play that tragic heroine that's all upset because her man didn't come back to home from America. So she's still waiting. You said you come back. I do not want to be in any musical where there is a helicopter. <laughs> See, what it comes down to is that I cannot run up a wall. <laughs> I am... Um, I don't think that there was uh, any role models that I had when I was growing up, anybody that I could look to and say, wow, I want to be like that. You know, I never saw anybody. It, you know, the only thing that's sort of Asian that was like that was Hello Kitty. <laughs> I don't want to model myself after Hello Kitty. She has no mouth. <laughs> she cannot even say hi back to you after you say, hello, kitty. <laughs> she is, uh, she can't speak, she can't eat. She's just a pussy with a bow on it. <laughs> pussy made by Sanrio! <laughs> I get nervous when people say to me, <laughs> I just can't tell any of you Asians apart. <laughs> Uh, why do you have to tell us apart? <laughs> Are we going to be separated for some reason? <laughs> I don't know. I can't tell us apart. I was not born then embedded with a chip in my neck that would uh, automatically identify every Asiatic person that I had to come across. <laughs> Filipino.
people um, come up to me and they say, Margaret, what's going on with North Korea? What's up with that guy? Does he have a bomb? What's going on? What's going on with North Korea? What's up with that guy? Does he have a bomb? Margaret, what's going on with North Korea? I don't know. <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> Quit asking me. No, I do not have his phone number, please. All I know is that whenever they show Kim Jong-il in the news, they make him look crazy. He just like... <laughs> what the fuck is wrong with this food? <laughs> smiling his ass off. <laughs> I don't know what's happening over there. That's like me assaulting a redhead and going, whatever happened to the IRA? <laughs> <laughs> I sometimes completely forget that I'm Asian. Like I totally forget and when I'm reminded, it's a, a bit of a shock. I was on a, I was on a plane and um, the steward was coming down the aisle, serving lunch to everyone, and he's coming down the aisle. Asian chicken salad. Asian chicken salad. Asian chicken salad. And he gets to me, and he's like, Chicken salad. <laughs> what does he think I'm gonna do? of my people. in my homeland. <laughs> they use mandarin orange slices. <laughs> and crispy wonton crunches. Come with ranch, thousand island blue cheese, 
low fat vinaigrette. I don't think these are good for minorities in television and film. I don't think they're good for women either. I mean, if you see a woman in a TV show or a movie uh, above a size zero, she is immediately like no sex appeal and then relegated to the best friend with a heart of gold but still a wildebeest character. Like, <laughs> yeah, I can't get laid, but I got a lot of good advice. <laughs> I don't even see real women on reality shows. <laughs> I, I only actually really watched one reality show with regularity. I watched the Anna Nicole Smith show. Um, I was on it one time. I went to her. Um, I went to a Christmas party. She had invited me, and yes, I I had to go because I needed to raffle through her medicine cabinet. I, <laughs> I think she needed intervention. So I was, <laughs> I went to her house at really early, like at seven o'clock, and uh, she was already fucked up drunk. Just And I couldn't take it anymore, so I slammed her up against the wall and I made out with her for 10 minutes. And that is. That is the only time in my life that I have ever been a top. I've been really negatively affected by um, the lack of images of real women. And I think, uh, I, I mean, the worst way I've, I've suffered is having eating disorders for forever, you know, suffering from that. It's just horrible. Uh, you know, I think I know when it began. I was eight years old. I started my performance career as a dancer, which I'm sure you knew. I, I am wearing a footless tight, after all. And, um, there is, a, you know, a kind of language that I speak with my body, that it's not just, you know, it's um, a, a fluidity and a grace that I just move with a kind of love that's so <laughs> effervescent and clear. I, I do, uh, my body speaks a language of desire. <laughs> and so I was in a, um, I was doing a show, I, I was a, in a ballet recital, it was my first big show and uh, it went very well and after the recital my father came backstage and he said you are the fattest ballerina <laughs> okay <laughs> so I, I put away my dancing shoes and I, I picked up a teen fashion magazine and this became my new religion because it seemed to me that if you were thin that meant you were loved and I just wanted to be that so for years, I struggled, dieted, exercised, starved, you know, just to get my body small as, as it would go. And then I would fuck as many people as possible because God knows this body is not going to last. <laughs> I am turning back into a pumpkin at midnight, so bring it on. Went on every diet. The Atkins, oh my God. That dude just died. Oh. He just died. I have to go to his grave with two big loaves of bread and just dance on it. <laughs> I hurt my feet. Um, and then I won't pee on a stick. Uh, 
<laughs> I, uh, I, uh, I, I went on one diet, my last diet I ever went on. I ate only persimmons for six months. And I was driving in my car here in LA, and it was about four o'clock in the afternoon. So it was like a lot of traffic, and I'm just driving, kind of rocking out. Holiday. <laughs> Celebrate. It's a holiday. <laughs> and I realized I am gonna shit right now! And it, it caught me off guard. <laughs> because normally you have a good 20 minutes. <laughs> there is this window of opportunity where you know to start looking for a Barnes and Noble or some kind of... <laughs> equivalent book music superstore that, you know... We all take that for granted, but I did not have that luxury. No, I'm gonna shit. No, I'm not. No, I'm not. No, 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 no. I, I, I'm not gonna shit. No, I'm not. I, I, I'm not. No. No, 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 I'm holding my ass so tight. I made a diamond in there. <laughs> Which was not my best friend. <laughs> and then it became crystal clear that indeed, I, I am gonna shit right now, I am. <laughs> What's with this masquerade? It's, <laughs> it's only me, I am, I am. Mm -hmm. yeah. I shall, I will. Indeed. Yeah. And I just have to let go and let God because <laughs> it's bigger than me. And uh, <laughs> he has a plan which <laughs> includes this. And I pray for the understanding that one day I will know why, but until that day comes, I'll just trust that he does work in mysterious ways. So, <laughs> yet I'm still trying to bargain a little bit, like, well, I'll just let out. <laughs> just... Huh? 
compromise myself. It's just a little bit. I mean, just a little bit. Just let out a little bit. I'll just let out a little bit. Let out a little bit. Little bit. Holiday. <laughs> I turn that off. I don't want to get some weird, you know, Pavlov's dog association with that song. <laughs> and, um, I let out a little bit. <laughs> and it all came out! And I got to stop it! Oh God, I want to stop it! Ah! Ah! There was a point near the end where <laughs> I could have stopped it. <laughs> but by then I was like, why bother? <laughs> Live a little. I just had uh, trusted in, you know, these images for so long that, you know, I, I just bought into what the media was, was telling us about what women should look like. And, and they don't tell you in the diet books that this food plan might make you shit your pants! <laughs> Caveat emptor. And because I thought I was fat, I thought I was ugly, I thought I was unlovable, I believed in what the media said, I believed what my father said, and I just thought that I was just gross, and that um, you know I, I didn't accept my body as I was made, and I was now paying the price by sitting <laughs> in a pool. of my own shit. <laughs> Which was getting cold. <laughs> the only thing left to do at that point was to call people. <laughs> okay, you better call me right back because you are not gonna believe what I just did. <laughs> I 
I'm in my car right now. I just shit my pants. <laughs> So I, I went off the diet, and um, <laughs> I just kind of stopped. You know, I stopped all that stuff, dieting, all working out. And I, did, I had a lot of time on my hands to think about other things. Like, why was I so locked into this image of what I should be? And um, you know, why did I believe my father so much? And why did I get so mad at him all the time? I get so mad at him, like madder than I do at anybody else. I don't know why. I think the angriest I ever got at my dad was, I was visiting my parents. They were, they were taking care of my grandmother who had Alzheimer's and she was really sick. And uh, my father and my grandmother were seated in the living room and I walked in and they were watching TV. And my grandmother pissed on herself and my father didn't do anything about it. Like he just sat there like just ignoring it. And I totally knew that he was, he, he knew what, what happened, but he just, he just pretended like it didn't, and I was so angry that he would do that, that he would be so careless and callous. I mean, he was, he was just disgusting. I just really hated him, and I wanted to help her, but I, I was so angry that I, I couldn't even move. I just, I was so mad, and finally I got some motion, and I went and I got my mom, and my mom came in, and she picked my grandmother up, and my grandmother started talking to my mother like she was a soldier during the Korean War that my grandmother had fallen in love with. And my mother is fully going along with it, like, oh, how could I forget that? <laughs> uh, <laughs> let's go somewhere private. <laughs> I, I left, and I didn't speak to my father for a long time. Not until the funeral. My grandmother passed away, and I, I went um, to the service, and I saw my dad, and he was, he was crying, but not just crying, like this, this howling crying, this wild hunger, this pain that I had never heard from him before, and it was shocking to me because Korean people basically have two emotions, <laughs> stony silence, and get out of my store! <laughs> Oh, actually, there's three. There. <laughs> and my father, through his choking sobs, told me that he couldn't accept his mother's disease, that he couldn't see her, he couldn't watch her like that. He had been such a mama's boy, and he had always been her favorite, and he couldn't take it. He couldn't, he couldn't watch it, and um, he was broken. Like, it broke him, and the saddest part for him was that when she died, she had no idea who he was, and I just, I just forgave him, and I loved him more at that moment than I have ever loved, and my mother is, is great at this kind of stuff because she is such a caretaker and so, so comfortable with these situations. You know, she's a natural giver. So she does this all the time for our family. This is the best cadaver I have ever seen. <laughs> she looks so fresh. Good job, you know, yeah? When I come, they give me big discount. <laughs> because I bring them a lot of business. <laughs> yeah, because I bring a mm, grandfather here, and then I bring grandmother here. 
you know, I'm gonna bring daddy here. <laughs> Women and eating disorders have such a long history, but now I see it happening to gay men. And when it comes to anorexia, bulimia, body dysmorphia, gay men are far more worse than women. Oh, they take it way more seriously. <laughs> Why diet when you can take crystal meth? <laughs> I hear voices, but they tell me I look hot, so. <laughs> I think everybody should go on my diet. It's called the fuck it diet. And um, basically what it is if, is if I wanna eat something but it has a lot of fat or carbs, I just take a moment and I go within. <laughs> and I say, fuck it. And I eat it and <laughs> I said I. Now you have to do it six times a day. <laughs> and it works really well with the fuck that shit exercise program. <laughs> I get really upset when I see young girls getting liposuction and breast implants. I'm like, how is that any different than foot binding? Like, how is it? I don't know. Like, plastic surgery is supposed to do something, you know, something for your spirit to make you feel good about yourself. But to me, it is just brainwashing, manipulation, and mutilation of women. I'm still going to get it. But I... Well, I'm gonna get a lot too. I will have the most tightest. This is a facelift. Just pull my scalp back until it just look like a scrunchie. Just pull it back. Pull it back. No more. 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 To insert a spam key back there so I could tighten it up every day. And I'll be on QVC selling my own line of in-home self-injectable Botox <laughs> called Chotox. <laughs> um, Asian people get all kind of plastic surgery, like they get the eye, uh, the eye surgery where they cut up your eye to make it all big or something <laughs> so that you could see more, I guess. I don't know why. I prefer to just turn my head. <laughs> I guess I'm just old school. <laughs> Somebody suggested that my mom get that eye surgery. And she said, no, because then I will always look surprised. may contain nuts or particle of nuts. <laughs> I 
I'm very inappropriate. <laughs> Which makes me a problem dinner guest. <laughs> because at some point during the evening, somebody inevitably says, okay. <laughs> yeah, I know, okay, good. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Don't go there. I live there. I bought a house there. I'm going to take you there. Because when um, something hurts me, I have to say something. Because if I don't, it'll just burn me up. And uh, you know, I feel like living as a minority in America feels like dying of a thousand paper cuts. And I ain't going out like that. So I have to speak my history. And <laughs> um, the one time I was uh, driving in my car. I did not shit this time, thank you. <laughs> no, I was driving and um, I was driving behind this woman and she had a bumper sticker that, that said, this car was built with tools, not chopsticks. And it was in that really Hong Kong fooey font that's really chinky, like it's like, hi ya! You know, it's like super <laughs> feng shui and bamboo calligraphy font. And, um, I just exploded with anger. Like, I just got all gigantic and yellow like the Incredible Asian Hulk. Like, <laughs> <laughs> and um, I pulled up next to her, and I had nothing funny to say, nothing clever at all. I just started to scream, like, <laughs> ah! That's racist on your car! That is a racist bumper sticker! I screamed for such a long time that um, I forced her to make a left turn against the red light, and <sighs> I felt really good about myself. <laughs> I don't want to be the better person. above it. <laughs> I do want to sink down to their level. <laughs> I am not going to turn the other cheek. I will show you what you going to turn, okay? <laughs> I was uh, promoting my film at a big multiplex theater, and there was a little girl standing in front of my poster, and uh, she's like 12, and all of her friends are around. And she's like, Ew, who wants to go see that Chi Chow Ching Chong lady? Oh, I don't want to go see that Chi Chow Ching Chong lady. Do you want to go see that Chi Chow Ching Chong lady? <laughs> I want to go see the Chu Chow Ching Chong lady. <laughs> and she ran into the bathroom. And I just stood outside like. <laughs> and she never came out. And <laughs> I'm sure she still has nightmares about me grabbing her foot from underneath her bed. calling her up from inside her own home. 
I know who you are, and I am the Choo Chow Ching Chong Lady! I got back from uh, Toronto where they have a, a serious outbreak of SARS, you know, severe Asian racism syndrome. And I was. I was in the airport and there was these big snowboarder guys and they had white masks around their necks. And as soon as they saw me, they put their masks on. So I just went. Egg roll? <laughs> I was doing a show at um, a university in Tennessee, and there was a theologian in the audience who had told his students that homosexuality was inherently evil because the only way that gays could express love was through fisting. So I wrote a special piece just for him about <laughs> two friends of mine who had recently hooked up. I know that uh, we haven't been going out for a long time and it might be kind of soon for this conversation, but I don't know, I just don't feel it. It's like, I don't, I don't know what happened to me when I met you. It's like everything changed, like my whole world just got Right, you know, like just the colors were so <laughs> colory, you know, like it's just that <laughs> feeling that I had, and um, I guess people would say that I was a player or whatever, and I, I never, never meant to be that. It's just that I was just afraid, you know, like I was afraid that people would really get to know me, you know, and then you know they would see who I was really, and they would just leave. So I wasn't, you know playing a game, I was just scared, and, um, <laughs> but when I'm with you, it's like I know that, uh, you know me, and, um, <laughs> you're still here, you know, it's like, <laughs> it's just, it, it's just really good, it's like when I'm with you, I feel like I'm, I'm home, you know? <laughs> Like I just like walk in the front door and I'm like, <laughs> oh, you're my home. <laughs> and uh, I just have to say, and I'm sure that you already know, <laughs> I love you. I have the good fortune of doing an on-again, off-again column for gay.com and planetout.com. And what's great about it is I get to talk to a lot of younger gays and lesbians, and these kids have the same problem over and over again, that they come out to their parents, and their parents send them to therapy in order to make them straight. Wh why would you not want a gay child? rather 
have a gay child. <laughs> if you have a gay son, you know he's not going to be shooting up his high school. <sighs> that would get in the way of yearbook. If I could be sure that my uh, baby would be gay, I would, I, would, I would do it. I would deal with the vagina explosion. I would <laughs> just put it back together with some rice, and then it would be <laughs> all good, you know. <laughs> there has to be a way. Like, if you go and um, camp out in Las Vegas and go see Celine Dion every day, every single day, day of your entire pregnancy. I think it'll soak itself in there, you know, real good. It'll sink in real good. Maybe if I got the gayest sperm I could find. If I hung around a Pacific Design Center for long enough, <laughs> then... You gotta be tricky, though to do that. So I would probably have to stuff a bunch of swatches up there, and then maybe one of them will walk by. Is that a silk ivory damask? I haven't said, ah! You know, you fall in. <laughs> no, that wouldn't have, that would be, that would be a miracle. <laughs> that happened. But if it, it did, then I, I would just, you know, then I could walk down, you know, heavy with child, and I would go into rage, and uh, <laughs> they would say, bitch, we don't have a manger. <laughs> so then I would have to have the baby at the mother load. And the three wise drag queens would come. <laughs> bearing gifts of 1,000 thread count sheets. <laughs> Hair products by Frederick Fakai. <laughs> and a copy of the Immaculate Collection. to have a gay kid. He would be a Boy Scout, and he would teach all the other Boy Scouts how to build a fire with two sticks and a backhanded compliment. <laughs> and he would take his boyfriend to the prom, and if anybody said anything to them, he would say, any kind of love is fine. It's your hate you have to watch. <laughs> and uh, he would be a soldier, and he would change the slogan from don't ask, don't tell, to don't fuck with me, queen! <laughs> don't ask, don't tell. How dare they? How dare they ask you to die for your country, yet not allow you to be who you are? As if you could win a war without lesbians. <laughs> I'll read the map. <laughs> Pussy strong enough for a man, but made for a woman.
racism and homophobia are the exact same thing. And that when somebody insults me and they say that I'm fat or ugly or not funny or stupid or whatever, I can argue that. But when somebody says something about my race, I feel it because that's who I am. When somebody attacks your sexuality, it hurts because that's you. You, you can't change that. Se sexuality and race are the essential parts of ourselves we cannot remove or destroy. They are the you of you, the me of me. And I'm so fortunate to have grown up in both camps, this, this activism, uh, this history that I have in me. I, I think my favorite activist group was from the 80s, and they were ACT UP. And uh, they had a great slogan, which was, silence equals death. It meant, if we don't talk about AIDS, we will die of AIDS. And um, I adopt a similar slogan. For me, silence equals non-existence. If I don't give too much information, if I don't go there, it's like I was never there in the first place. And I noticed this most... I noticed this most right after September 11th, when, when there were no gays or lesbians invited to give their opinion about what was going on. There were no women invited to give their opinion. There were hardly any people of color invited. And if they were, they were Muslim Americans and Arab Americans talking about the violence that they had experienced because they shared the same skin color as the terrorists, which is heinous and dumb. That's like arresting Emmanuel Lewis because Gary Coleman punched that woman. <laughs> and yes, I am very worried about the troops, but I am also worried that my reproductive rights might be taken away from me. And I... I am as scared of terrorism as everybody else, but I am also scared that people over here are getting um, arrested by the FBI and the INS for having the wrong last name. And I'm so, so sorry that there is so much starvation in, in Iraq and so much starvation all over there, but, but I am so sorry that there are young girls here starving themselves to death so they can look like the actresses on TV. I am hurt all over for this awful war and all of this stuff, but I am hurt because somebody just got called a fag or a dyke or a pansy or a sissy or a bull dyke or a chink or a nigger or a kike or a wetback or an injun or a jap or a bitch or a whore or a cunt. And unless to you, that's a term of endearment because... To <laughs> right context it is. Um, <laughs> that person is being attacked because of who they are and I don't accept that. So I think if racial minorities, sexual minorities, feminists, both male and female, hell, all liberals, if we all got together and, and had this big, too much information, go there voice, if we just went and did it, that would equal power. And that power would equal change. And that change would equal a revolution. Pussy crack con! <laughs> and I don't care! <laughs> Thank you. Good night. Thank you.
So you call each other back, clap, like